Okay. All right, would you like to go ahead and get started, presenter? Sure. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to the Trinity alumni, and uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Phil Erickson. Uh, I grew up in Trinity County and graduated from Trinity High School back in 1988, Gold Wolves. Uh, I'm here to talk about my current profession as a firefighter with the Tacoma Fire Department in Washington State. But uh, first I'll give you a little history about myself and my journey to my career, my uh, dream career. Here we go. Uh, I graduated from Trinity High in June of 1988, and 30 days later, I was on my way to boot camp in the United States Navy. Uh, after successfully completing boot camp and graduating from six months long lithography school, I was assigned to the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz, which was based in, out of Bremerton, Washington. Um, Nimitz holds a ship's crew of nearly 4,000 people, which has increased to almost 7,000 when the air wing's on board and they're underway. Um, that's nearly twice the population of Weaverville today on one ship. One of my many jobs aboard the USS Nimitz was as a firefighter. I was assigned the number one nozzleman for Repair Locker 1 Bravo which basically means our team was responsible for extinguishing fires in the middle third of the ship from the highest point of the superstructure to the bottom of the ship well below the water line. This was my first experience as a firefighter and I was hooked. Between then and now, I have uh, done many things and seen many places. I have been very lucky and traveled to many places. I have uh, walked on the Great Wall of China, been to Thailand, Dubai, although when I was there, it was not the beautiful, rich city you think of today. Um, I was lucky enough to make a month-long safari in South Africa. Um, and travel all around there and see and do many things. Upon leaving the Navy uh, in July of 1992, I met a man, Mike Johnson. At the time, Mike was a chief with the Seattle Fire Department. Chief Johnson uh, also served in the USS Navy as a diver. He took me under his wing and showed me what firefighting looked like in the big city. This is where I learned that firefighters were, weren't just volunteers of communities that joined to provide a service to their neighbors. I saw that firefighting as a professional career, a group of highly trained men and women who make life saving decisions in a compressed timeline with little information. Becoming a firefighter is not easy as raising your hand and saying I'll do that. It's a very competitive process to obtain a position as a professional firefighter. For eight years, I stood in many lines out in the rain for hours just to get one of a limited number of applications that were available just to test. During those eight years, while I was testing, I also had to support my family, so I started my own construction company to improve the chances of getting Hired as a professional firefighter, I also joined the local volunteer fire department where I lived. Firefighting is a very physical and mentally demanding job. So I also prepared by taking classes at the local junior college at night and working out regularly to keep in shape. It took me eight years of testing, taking no less than six tests a year to obtain a job. When the city of Tacoma called and offered me a position, I attested with approximately 4,000 people and they offered 24 jobs of those 4,000 people taking the test. And not all of those 24 made it through the recruiter company. 
On April 24, 2000, I was lucky enough to be offered one of those 24 positions with the Tacoma Fire Department. And I started the nine week fire academy as a recruit firefighter. The academy is where you learn the basic skills of firefighting and we were trained in many disciplines. The chemistry of fire, air movement in a burning building, tools, hose to include water flow and pressures, how to operate the apparatus, hazardous material response, emergency medical technician, uh, and live fire training. Once graduated from the academy as recruits, we were transferred out to the field as probationary firefighters for the remainder of our first year. Here we got high intensity, hands-on training, hot training, with an more probationary status at the end of the first year, we were sent out to the field as firefighters. I was sent to engine 10. At the time, engine 10 was one of the busiest engine companies in our country, running more than 4,000 calls a year. Now we have three or four companies just in the city of Tacoma that run that many calls. In 2006, I transferred from engine 10 to station eight as the engine eight driver. Station eight, truck two, medic two, and battalion two disciplines beyond firefighting here. We're trained as to save people in confined spaces, trench rescue, structural collapse, high angle rope rescue, and swift water. In 2011, I promoted to Lieutenant and moved to station one, which is also our headquarters station. Station one is double is a double house housing engine one and ladder one, which is a tillered ladder. And I am assigned as a lieutenant on ladder one on the C shift. There is a big difference between engines and ladders. Engine carries hose and water. The engine has a pump, which increases the pressure of water and pushes it through the hose so it can be applied to the seat of the fire. We call engine guys nozzle heads. They think they put out the fire. <laughs> ladder one is a tillered 100 foot aerial ladder. Tillered meaning there is a firefighter that drives the end of the ladder. This makes it more maneuverable in tight city streets. The 100 foot aerial ladder is capable of reaching the roof of a seven story building. The ladder itself is basically a big toolbox. We vent buildings, search for the fire, search for the seat of the fire, basically showing the nozzle heads where the fire is. We also search for people that are trapped in buildings. This is a photo of some firefighters doing what we call vent ender search, where they vent the window, climb in, look for trapped victims and get back out while the fire is burning around them. We use the jaws of life to extricate people from automobile accidents, rope rescue and elevator entrapments. The engine guys call us trucker monkeys or knuckle draggers. We break things. In the city of Tacoma, we're very lucky to have a lot of resources at our hand. At a 111, which is what we call a residential structure fire, we're able to get four engines, two ladders, a medic and a battalion unit, all within minutes to the fire. Together, we work together as a team of highly trained individuals in hazardous environments to stabilize 
the situation. And that is my presentation. Any questions? Yes, thank you so much. There are some questions. Uh, go ahead and... Thank you so much. So um, you, there's a question in the queue about why do you think you got so lucky? It sounds like it's a very competitive process. How did you get one of those? What do you think set you apart for one of those uh, 20 spots um, for the, for the 4,000? I think it was my commitment to becoming a firefighter. The fact that uh, being a volunteer, gave me a leg up, uh, being actively in it, showing those departments that uh, it wasn't just a whim. Um, again, going to college, taking those extra classes at night, um, helped with the written exams uh, to prepare for that and uh, the oral boards that came with uh, the testing process. Nice. Um, we appreciate how you're kind of offering a well-rounded sense of, of what gave you a, an, a leg up. I think that's really helpful for students to hear about. <clears throat> do you, um, in your work in with other firefighters, do you see any common uh, like threads or traits, personality traits amongst firefighters? Are there specific characteristics or traits that you think, um, you know, make make firefighters unique? Yeah, they all have a, a pretty deep desire to help those around them in their community. Um, it's not something they do for themselves so much, but uh, that they really do like helping those around them, especially in their time of need. Uh, and they're a real tight knit group of people, uh, a brother and a sisterhood, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, you referenced the seat of the fire a few times in your presentation. Can you explain what that means? Sure. The, the seat of the fire is basically where it started. So that's where the, the largest group of fire is going to be. So if it's in a bedroom and it started in a mattress from smoking in bed or something like that, that mattress in the bed is the seat of the fire. Although, a lot of times the fire gets away, gets out of the room, out of the cage, and you will see it burning and, uh, and the smoke and the elevated heat and uh, products of combustion along the ceiling. But the real fire is the, the bed itself. So we have to get rid of the hot smoke and gas out of the, uh, the house, allow it to lift so the firefighters can crawl underneath of it with their hose and nozzles and get right to the seat of the fire and extinguish it there. And then we go through the house, pulling ceilings and walls, making sure that the fire isn't hiding somewhere else and gonna re rekindle and, and burn the house down in a couple of hours. Wow. Um, <clears throat> when victims are stuck in houses, um, you know in movies, people jump from, from windows and they jump onto mats or uh, they jump onto things. Um, does does that happen in, in real life? It does. It does happen in real life. Um, uh, fire inside of a house is extremely hot. And when you open a window, that's the fresh air it needs to breathe and grow. So if you're sitting in a window and the fire's in the house behind you, it is coming to that window and the heat that it brings with it will push you right out of the window and make you jump great distances rather than sit there and burn. Wow. Um, so do you have, I guess, following that kind of the question in the queue is, um, what advice and recommendations do you have for people who may ever find themselves caught inside of a structure fire for their own safety or um, survival rate? Uh, stay low below the smoke and the heat crawl out immediately. Don't worry about your, your gym bag or your computer or cell phone. Get out. You can replace all that stuff. The other thing is sleep with your bedroom doors closed. Uh, it's proven that uh, keeping your bedroom door closed uh, compartmentalizes that house up. So even though there's 
a fire in another bedroom up on your floor or in the hallway, it buys a lot of time. It keeps the products of heat and combustion out of the room that you're in. And it gives us time to get to a window um, to, to get you out. So if you're in there, go out, the door's closed. You can open up the window, make sure we know you're in there. If, if you go and hide somewhere, we can't find you. In your line of work, do you also support any kind of wild wildland fire or you just do predominantly urban um, structure fires? We're predominantly a city fire department. We do have some urban interface that happens in our uh, outlying areas. So we do do uh, some wildland firefighting, but it's not, not to the extent that you see there in Weaverville with large forested areas. And uh, we're set up uh, totally differently. We, we do have two wildland fire pickup truck rigs with wildland hose and for our urban areas, but mainly we're a city fire department. And is Swiftwater Rescue um, a requirement of all fire training? Do you have do you have rivers there in the Tacoma area? Is, is that just a, a requirement or is that unique to your to your location? Um, Swiftwater training is unique to individual department locations. Uh, we do have a lot of rivers uh, and uh, we have the uh, Puget Sound near our city. So, uh, but the Swiftland, Swiftwater Rescue is something that I do with uh, FEMA, Washington Task Force One, where I'm also uh, a federally uh, rescue personnel for the nation. Uh, FEMA is made up of firefighters from all over different departments. They come together to make this one federal unit that can be deployed anywhere in the country when needed. So my swift water training is mainly through there. Um, and there are numerous task force around the country. So typically the Washington task force would go to the East Coast or other US territories to help them with their problems that they're having, whether it be fire, flood, tornadoes, hurricanes, whatever. Um, we were dispatched down to uh, Katrina when that flood happened in New Orleans there. And the reason the West Coast goes to the East Coast is because the East Coast firefighters that are involved in that are stationed there at their home. They're already a resource that's being used locally. So they would take resources from a distant area that aren't being used and bring them in as backup to support those people that are already there. And it's not just firefighters. Uh, our FEMA group is uh, comprised of law enforcement officers. We have doctors, we have search dogs, we've got uh, structural engineers, uh, radio specialists, um, it's a large eclectic group of people that come together to solve problems. Following that, you um, mentioned a little bit about kind of the physical mental fortitude that, that is necessary. Can you talk about how um, you develop skills to work with others, if that's people on your engine, people in your station, or community at large? Yeah, everyone knows I don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, actually we, we work with people daily, right? So in your station, we have uh, my station alone, uh, six individuals that work there. Um, and we not just work there, but we live and sleep there, right? So for 24 hours at a time, we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. We cook, clean, clean the bathrooms, mop the floors, vacuum. Uh, we train together daily on our job skills. Um, we go out into the public and do commercial building inspections. So we're dealing with the public and face-to-face uh, -face time with them, explaining to them how to protect them and their businesses from fire so that they can stay in, uh, in business and keep their employees employed. Um, we go on medical calls, so we're constantly going to people's homes, walking into their into their living rooms, bedrooms, you name it, 
and uh, dealing with their loved ones. So you got to have a good community. The uh, communication skills, um, just on the job, when it comes to the community, we're deeply rooted there as well. We host Easter egg hunts and we show up at block parties and put on, uh, uh, how do you say it? Uh, mock, mock firefighting events. Like we will do and bring a car in from a junkyard and cut it up so they can see how the tools work and the things like that. So we're, we're constantly working within the community. We were paid for, bought and paid for by the community. Their tax dollars pay for our service. We don't leave bills when we leave. So uh, every single citizen is our employer. Nice. Um, <clears throat> it's a great public service. Um, do you have any sort of really memorable calls that you've been on that you'd like to share with participants? Uh, memorable. Um, I think the one of my most memorable calls is, uh, happened on Easter Sunday. We found a den of baby ducks stuck in a storm drain and we saved them. <laughs> Did you take those ducks home? Where are those ducks now? No, no, we, we let them go. <laughs> mother, mother duck was stuck up on top at the street level and her little ducklings had all fallen into the storm drain. <laughs> I, I love that you've probably witnessed all kinds of dramatic experiences and the one that stands out is about mama duck and her little ducklings so uh, no, that's it. well that's that's part of the mental strength right uh you can't carry we do see some you know death and mayhem in our job unfortunately and you can't carry those calls with you you got to be able to learn how to, to shed those and look at the bright side of things so Following that kind of um, vein, there is a question about um, how do you how do you do that? How do you move through sort of trauma and tragedy um, in your in your day to day work? Well, we we talk to between ourselves. We have support groups um, after uh, typically bad calls. We will sit down and we'll all talk through it together. Um, but, you know, staying in physical shape, getting out and being physical and uh, things like that help you to create, you know, strong mental stability as well. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, well, you talked about um, your community college classes and how that kind of gave you uh, an edge maybe in the competition. What type of classes were you taking during that time during uh, your your nights at the call at the community college? I was just taking uh, basic English and math classes at the time. the The written exam was based on your general GED exam uh, or an SAT test. So uh, I I took just a lot of basic math and English, um, reading and writing comprehension to boost that up. Um, a lot of tests today are formatted really differently. Our current uh, entry test is a booklet that they send out to you, and it's just a memorization game. So memorize the book from cover to cover and then go take the test on the book. But when I was testing, it was uh, more vast and wide open as to what the questions could be, but they were all generally down the lines of an SAT or a GED exam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have to do any continuing education units or stay updated on certificates or um, on an annual basis? Absolutely. So being a tech rescue specialist with the city, I have to maintain uh, all those disciplines, the confined space, the trench, the rope rescue. Um, we have to do annual training in every single one of those disciplines in order to stay current. We have our emergency medical technician certification that we have to uh, do monthly uh, seminars um, and classes, take exams in order to keep our uh, EMT certificates for doing medical work as well as the firefighting too. I mean, um, once you get trained, 
you, you're constantly having to go back and, and practice those basic company standards or what we call them. Um, just last shift, we met with the battalion chief who checked up us up on us to make sure that we haven't forgotten the things we've learned at the beginning. We're not getting lazy. So we throw ladders, we practice cutting holes in the chainsaws and roofs for ventilation, practice throwing our packs for time to make sure that we can still put them on in under the minute uh, certification that it takes. Do you have that quintessential fire pole that we often see in movies? Is that a real thing? Do you slide down the pole? Does that actually happen? Um, two stations. We have two stations left in the city that are over 100 years old each. Um, they still have fire poles, but they've gotten away from uh, fire poles in fire stations due to injuries. People not holding on in the middle of the night when they're half asleep running out the door to a fire and then falling to the bottom or twisted ankles when they hit the bottom. So they've, uh, most fire stations are single story now. I, I, that's a cycle of improvement right there. I like how real life feeds and improves the, the techniques and strategies. <laughs> Uh, we have a few minutes left. I want to encourage any students to go ahead and submit any questions you might have. Um, I'm going to give our students a, a, about 30 more seconds to ask some questions. Um, can you talk about uh, a little bit about um, this lifestyle, do you work standard shifts? Um, is it something that um, has a sort of a stable schedule to it? Yeah, we work, uh, at a, it's called a Detroit schedule. So we work a 24 hour shift, we get two days off, we work another 24 hour shift, and then we get four days off. And then about every just over every month, we have to work an extra shift, which we call a debit day, in the middle of our four days off. Uh, our work week works out to be a 47.3 hour work week. But uh, the this, this shift schedule is totally different. So it's not like going to work Monday to Friday. Um, basically, if I work Monday, this week, I'd have Tuesday, Wednesday off and work Thursday, and then I'd have four days off. So that would work the following week. It'd be Tuesday, Friday, and then Wednesday, Saturday, and then Thursday, Sunday, and it rolls around like that. And we work weekends and holidays for straight pay. We don't get double time for that. Um, it's considered your shift, and if it falls on Christmas, it falls on Christmas. It doesn't matter. Do you guys have a station dog? No. <laughs> do you want one? No. <laughs> some fire departments do. Um, there are some of our close by uh, departments that have uh, fire investigative dogs and they are trained to go out and look for arson. Um, but the city of Tacoma does not have any dogs on, uh, on the roster. Thank you. Um, do you have bunk beds? No. <laughs> Everybody has their own bed. Um, it is dorm room style and it all depends on uh, the station. So station 10 where I started out um, was designed after a small community home. And it looks like most of the hundred year old homes that are in that community, except for it's got the biggest garage door in the neighborhood. Um, it has a very small bedroom. So we have uh, three single beds there with uh, some lockers. So the crews can store their, their uniforms and things in the lockers. It has a very small kitchen. There is no dining room or dining hall there. They have uh, a little living room area which covers the, the office for the officer. It is the living room, it is the dining room. Now, uh, Station one, where I am located at, is a larger station. So we have more of a, a home setting. We have a living room where we can relax in the evening. There's a front office to greet 
people when they come to the front door. We have a kitchen and a dining room. The, the crew members uh, sleep in one large dorm. And then the engine officer and myself share uh, an officer's room. Uh, we really appreciate getting a glimpse into kind of the, the living components uh, of, of the station. Thank you so much. Um, in closing, do you have a kind of a, a specific theme or message um, to current Trinity County students? Um, a theme. What I would say is uh, as much messing around as I did in school as I wish I paid a little bit more attention back then. Um, the school work is uh, the basis for everything you do. Um, there's a great big world outside of Weaverville and uh, when you get there you'll need to have some basic skills that you learn through elementary and high school. Um, so you know those of you that are lucky enough to go on to college uh, I highly recommend it. Wish I had tried that a little earlier in my life than later. Um, but uh, there's a lot of things to see and do in this world, and I think everyone should get out and enjoy it. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to wrap up this, this conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Phil, to our Trinity alumni. Um, you're our first FIRE presenter, so we really appreciate you bringing a real face to that profession. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I gotta set the bar instead of fall under it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> thank you to our students. Uh, thank you to our staff and educators. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and close out the meeting. So thank you so much, Phil. All right. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. Bye, Phil. Bye-bye.